Um, let me briefly define the, the, the background, the topic, and if I say anything that is uh, uh, confusing or anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand and Matt can let me know, and I'd be happy to um, address something that I go over too quickly or that needs more elaboration. Intellectual property in the modern capitalist 21st century age is an entrenched part of the Western legal system, America, Europe, etc., and other countries as the West tries to push it and gets it entrenched in those countries. It is considered widely to be part of the capitalist property rights system. In fact, it's you know patent and copyright, trademark and trade secret, and other types of intellectual property or called intellectual property for a reason. Um, it was for a propaganda reason to try to get these things uh, thought of as a property right. Originally, they were thought of as privileges or policy tools um, by the monarch or the state, uh, but, but under attack by free market defenders, um, the proponents of IP started calling them property rights. So this is where we are now. We have a system where Patent law, copyright law, trademark, trade secret, and other types of IP, which I could go into, uh, are basically part of the landscape. Um, now, the libertarian position, which I've argued for over a decade now, almost two decades now, um, the libertarian position is that patent and copyright law and other types of IP law are completely 100% incompatible with free markets, competition, um, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and individual property rights. Um, so I'm totally opposed to patent and copyright law. I don't think we should reform it. That would be a good step, but I think we should totally abolish it. I believe that patents impose hundreds of billions of dollars of damage on the economy of the US, let's say, every year. Uh, I believe copyrights also impose damage and cultural distortion, and it represses and suppresses freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and it arms the state to um, come up with excuses to regulate the internet and restrict internet and digital freedom. So there's basically nothing whatsoever good about patent and copyright and other forms of intellectual property like trademark and trade secret. Um, but they are definitely entrenched. So that's a fact of the modern world. Okay, And I've talked at length on this. I've got tons of podcasts and lectures and articles and so do other people, which I've collected at my website, um, c4sif.org. So the background is that we live in a world with lots of um, non-free market, non-libertarian um, interventions and measures and policies and practices and institutions like the drug war, taxation, minimum wage law, regulations, um, uh, immigration restrictions, um, war itself, conscription lurking in the background, you know, all these things, they're there. They're unlibertarian. We don't like them. Um, and intellectual property. So the question is, what do we do about them? Well, the, the political is, answer is that we should work to abolish them, okay? But this course is more about practical ways that, as a person living in the real world, what do you do about it? So my, uh, my way of looking at it is that there's, um, there's different approaches. Number one, there's the moral approach. So if your question is, what do I do as a moral person, in particular as a libertarian? How do I act in the world? Um, is it legitimate or moral for me to take part of the given system? Can I drive on public roads? Can I take part in the patent and copyright system, etc.? So that's one type of question. And then there are other practical questions that um, relate to this. Um, for example, if I don't want to use intellectual property, how can I avoid it? Or is it a good idea for me to avoid it or to use it? Okay. So all these issues. Um, arise. So let me focus really quickly on the two main types of intellectual property, which is patent and copyright. Patent law governs um, inventions. Copyright governs 
um, creative expressions, artistic works. Okay, these are the two big things. So let's take copyright first. In a way, the question is a little bit moot because the way copyright works is it's automatically granted ever since 1989 in the United States after we acceded to the Berne Convention, uh, which eliminated formalities, which was previously you had to register a copyright and put a copyright notice on a work to get a copyright. Now those requirements are eliminated. So under the current law, ever since 1989, copyright is automatically granted. So every time you write something down, make a painting, write a software program, you instantly have a copyright granted by the federal government, whether you want it or not. And it's almost impossible to get rid of it. Okay. So the first thing to do is to recognize what the landscape is, what the threats are, what your rights are, what your options are. And the same thing is true for patent law. So for copyright, um, the question would be, what should you do? What can you do? Now, one of the approaches I think you can take is um, most of the things that people author, okay, we want the word to get out there, okay? And so if, because the copyright automatically attaches to these things, it is a restriction on what others can do with it. So for most people, as Cory Doctorow, for example, says, you know, um, uh, if, if people don't know about your works, obscurity that's going to doom you. You want your works to be spread. So one thing you can do is try to release your works into the commons as much as possible. Um, there's both a moral and a practical reason for this. The moral reason is because copyright is, is totally unjustified and illegitimate. Um, so that's the moral reason. The practical reason is that you want people to spread your ideas and your work. And you can do this in today's world by means of using the Creative Commons licenses. Now, the one I recommend that people use is the Creative Commons attribution only. That's CC-BY. Um, I would prefer CC0, which is basically making it almost public domain. I'm, I'm just concerned that the way the law works, that that is not an effective, legally enforceable license. And that means that people that read your works or want to use your works can't rely on the license because they don't trust it, and it's just like it's copyrighted still. So I think the most safe license would be the CCBY, which is what I try to use as much as I can. Um, now, practically, how does that help or hurt you? It helps you because it helps get the, it makes your work easy to copy and spread. And does it really hurt you? I don't think it does. There's lots of ways you could profit from your writing. And we have to recognize most people don't write or create for profit. They do it for other reasons. Um, or if they profit, they profit without the benefit of copyright law. So in the cases where you would profit monetarily, having a CCBY license wouldn't really hurt you um, at all. Um, you get your reputation out there. You get known more. And you... Uh, so one blog post I have is an example. If you think about uh, J.K. Rowling, Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter novels, who's now the first or second most rich woman in England. She's like a billionaire because of the movies and the merchandising and the novels from the Harry Potter series. Take her, for example. If she had released Harry Potter on Amazon Create Space, the first novel, and had become popular, she would have made some money because... The books are one or two or three dollars each. In a copyright free world, let's say, maybe she would have been pirated right away, but she still would have sold many copies. She would have made a good sum of money, but she would have established her name as the author of a very popular series. She could have, for example, said, um, uh, I've got book number two and three written already, and I will release it as soon as a hundred thousand or a million of my fans pledge $10 each to buy the book. I guarantee she could have done that. You know, that's $10, $20 million right there just for the next book or two. Um, so she easily is already a, a 10 or 20 millionaire after one or two or three books. And she wrote seven, by the way. So we can already see she's approaching $100 million of value in a copyright-free world. 
Um, in a copyright-free world, anyone could have made a movie on the Harry Potter series. But if there's one or two or three studios trying to make the first Harry Potter movie, someone would have an incentive to approach her and get her a cooperation um, advisor, you know, executive producer status and endorsement to make the movie be the most popular one. You know, the Harry Potter fans are going to flock to the movie that is endorsed and uh, authorized by the author of the books. So we could easily see a profit sharing arrangement where she makes another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. So already we can see that in a copyright free world, someone who has a popular work like a JK Rowling can easily become a, a multimillionaire. Um, so I see no reason why we can't have authors of very popular works um, uh, rewarded. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. Um, another thing, let's take the patent field. The patent field is a case of um, uh, inventions. What do you do? Well, there's a couple things you can do. I'm not saying no company should ever should never apply for patents. Um, sometimes you need to in today's world. You need to to uh, acquire an arsenal of patents that you can use defensively. But most smaller companies don't have the resources to acquire enough patents that would really be effective defensively in most cases against against competitors. And in any case, patents are never defensive against trolls, patent trolls, because you can't counter sue a troll. I mean, the whole pur purpose of having a patent arsenal is to have a weapon stash that you can use to counter sue someone who sues you for patent infringement, okay? So a competitor usually. So if a competitor sues you for infringing one of their patents, you look through your stack of patents and you kind of try to counter sue them back. That is a useful technique. It's a big deadweight loss on society and innovation, but I can see why companies do that. However, patent trolls don't make anything themselves, so they are, they're not vulnerable to a countersuit. So one of the big threats of patents is patent trolls, and acquiring patents doesn't help you with that. Uh, moreover, like I said, having a patent stash doesn't guarantee that you're going to have an arsenal that you can uh, use to defend yourself because there's no guarantee that the person suing you can be countersued for one of your patents. Uh, moreover, these patents are expensive, and in any case, it's extremely expensive to engage in a patent battle with a large uh, competitor. And so it's one approach some companies could take is instead of wasting money acquiring patents and uh, uh, acquiring an arsenal of patents that they could never use in the first place and they could never afford to defend because the attorney's fees are so high, just make a decision never to use patents. In fact, you could do what Twitter did and what Google has kind of quasi done you could announce, we have an anti-patent policy. Um, Twitter actually tied its own hands by agreeing with all of its engineers that um, they have a kind of a co-ownership right in its patents so that it cannot assert its patents aggressively, but only defensively. So what you could do is you could make a strategic decision not to ever use patents, not to even waste money acquiring patents. And um, you could announce this to the world, you could save money, and you could avoid getting locked into the trap of chasing a product design or something like that just because you happen to have a patent on it. You could just be free to follow the innovation where it takes you. Now, what about the danger of um, someone else patenting the same design that you've come up with? Well, you could take advantage of the current law, which ever since the 2000, I think, 11, uh, the America Invents Act under, under Obama, um, if you just simply publish, like on a blog or a website or a journal, if you publish your idea, then it prevents it would it would serve as a prior art defense against someone else patenting the same idea later. So you could just be totally open. You could publish your ideas and say, "Here's what our ideas are. We plan to pursue some of these. The rest of them we don't." And uh, now these ideas are public, and so the world, anyone in the world can use them, even our competitors, but any patent that's filed after this date would be um, challengeable as being invalid. So those are some, some of the techniques you can use. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a whole str strategical mindset to trying to 
get along in the world without without intellectual property and patents and copyrights. Um, uh, you can talk to lawyers like me, although most patent attorneys and copyright attorneys you talk to are going to be baffled by the idea that you don't want to use these laws to your advantage, that you want to find a way to not use them. Um, but in the software industry, for example, this has been going on for you know 20 years, the, uh, the GNU movement, the open software, uh, open software movement. Um, there's a growing free culture movement, which is similar. Um, there's a growing use of um, Creative Commons licenses among the artistic community. Um, companies like Wik Wikimedia, you know, um, they provide open source uh, images and things like this people can use. And so, of course, documentary makers and website designers are going to these sources instead. Uh, if you design software, you're going to use open source software. Um, so there's an increasing advantage of being part of the growing openness um, movement and advertising. If you're going to do it, advertise it, I would say. You do have to sometimes use intellectual property. Um, sometimes people get confused about what intellectual property means. So, for example, um, um, people think that unless you have a patent on an idea, you can't use it. That's not true. The patent is only necessary if you want to prevent other people from using it. The, the primary advantage of a patent – well, there are, three, there are three ways you could use a patent on an invention. Number one is to sue competitors to try to extract royalties or rents from them. If you think that's uh, too expensive or immoral or not your business model, that's not really a concern. And I think it, by and large, should not be a concern. Um, number two, you can use it defensively. But as I said, it's only a rare situation where you are going to be able to find a patent – in your arsenal of patents, if you're a small company, let's say, that happens to apply to a competitor's um, products. Um, and it's also a rare situation when you have the funds available to afford the $3 million or whatever it's going to take to pay attorneys to fight back against a patent attacker in the first place. So it's really just a huge waste. Um, for a startup company, let's say, it is true that if you start looking for funding from investors and venture capitalists, they will often ask you what your intellectual property situation is. Their main concern, especially for a small startup company, they don't, they're not really betting that you're going to become a patent troll and take your one or two or three or five or ten patents and sue competitors and make a trillion dollars. That's not what they're betting on. They realize that it's too expensive to assert your patents. They understand that the primary purpose of patents is defensive, to defend your rights. Um, but if that's the case, there are other ways to do that, that are, which, are, which are cheaper. As I said earlier, you could simply publish your ideas proactively and early on and establish a prior public written record, which prevents other people from patenting the same thing. So if, if a venture capitalist says, what's your IP strategy, what's your IP portfolio? You could say, well, we have a, a bunch of proprietary and good ideas. Some are trade secret, some are kept secret, and some we publish to prevent other people from patenting them. And otherwise, we don't want to waste your, your good investors' money, on you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on patents that we could never use. Instead, we choose to be nimble and quick and flexible and just use our innovations and our technology as we need to without being locked into a given set of patents. And to protect ourselves, we save our money, and we make sure we don't infringe other patents, and we publish our ideas as soon as we come up with them to prevent our competitors from patenting them. So there's a whole philosophy and a strategy there which is not normal in the business industry because everyone is so linked into this IP mentality. But there are definitely ways to survive in the world without IP. And even to save money doing it and to prosper um, um, while doing it. Um, I can keep talking about some different examples now that I have in the paper and in other uh, articles and blog posts I've written. But let me see here what, the, uh, what, what questions we have now. Um, Travis, I don't know if Matt wants to link anyone right. in. If anyone has a question, feel free to link them in. 
um, or got, I can start. Go ahead. We've got one question here from uh, Wesley Matthew. All right, go ahead. Uh, so how does J.K. Rowling or other authors make money to support themselves to keep writing books, that is, before they could become popular? Okay, so here, here's my response to that kind of question. First of all, I tried to address that already with, with the actual J.K. Rowling example. How do you support yourself? Um, l l let's first realize what kind of question this is. This is a question um, – it's a legitimate question. And quite often, the IP or the copyright advocate asks that question in a loaded way. In other words, they're not, they don't really want the answer. They just, they're, they're shouting the question out at you as a challenge. They're saying that – they're basically saying, unless you can show me how authors can make a lot of money um, in, your, in your free market society, I'm not going to be in favor of it. So that's what they're saying. Now, I don't think uh, – the questioner here is asking that, uh, but uh, we have to be wary of questions that are really loaded questions or, or, or statements posed as questions. Um, and we also have to understand that if, if you don't know the answer to a question, it doesn't mean that the copyright or patent system is legitimate. Um, the example I give is imagine that you lived in Soviet Russia in the, in the 1970s or 80s or 60s. And uh, someone was advocating for abolishing the communist system and establishing a free market. And someone says, well, how many brands of toothpaste will there be? How, how can we guarantee enough toothpaste will be sold? Um, I, I don't understand how I'm going to choose between all these different brands of toothpaste that are going to be sold. Even if you don't know what's going to happen in a free market… You can't predict how many brands of toothpaste, what the free market is going to look like. Just because you don't have a direct answer to that question because you can't predict the future doesn't mean that communism has to be kept in place. Okay, So that's kind of the first answer. Um, the, other, the other thing to be aware of is that most authors in today's society – okay, most authors in today's society don't make any money at all um, or much money. Uh, and there's several reasons for that. Um, I mean, just imagine the typical blog or even everyone's uh, participating in Facebook chat sessions and commenting. People do this. They don't do it for money. They do it because they're interested in doing it for some reason. Um, most academic texts or scholarly works are journal articles like in the social sciences, libertarian articles, economic articles um, don't get paid a dime. In fact… Several journals, you have to pay thousands of dollars just to be published there. Um, so most – the bulk of most creative work is done not for money anyway, and in human history and even in today's copyright world is done not for profit. And in the cases where it's done for profit, it's done for profit primarily of the publishing industry. The publishing industry, the publishers, um, Hollywood, etc., they – of the recording industry, the studios, they have been propped up. The whole system has arisen because of copyright. The whole publishing um, uh, institution that we have. Again, most authors don't make very much money, which is why a lot of authors are self publishing or going to create space on Amazon, things like this now. Most authors, if they make, you know, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars a year off of something, are pretty happy. Because for a lot of people, it's a side hobby or a side pursuit or something they would pursue anyway. So I think we have to compare today's situation, which has copyright, to a free, a free market. And you can't just say there's no way I can think of that most authors wouldn't get paid or would get paid in a free market, and therefore there's something wrong with this idea because most of them are not getting paid now. And in fact, under today's situation with the state in control of so many things, with so many regulations and taxes, um, uh, people are made worse off because of that alone. For, so for example, to take a, a, a silly example, if the government tomorrow reduced the income tax rate by 50 percent, then most people that are just – they have a regular job doing something, making their money, and they, they write on the side… Well, it's like they're getting a ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar a year payment right away, right? 
so they could use that to subsidize their creative pursuits. Um, so if we want there to be more creativity, we have to reduce the size and scope of the state. We have to reduce taxes. We have to reduce um, the state's controls, the state's um, – we also have to reduce the state's copyright system in the first place, which causes some works to be impermissible. Remixing, borrowing, derivative works, sequels, unauthorized movies, things like this. Uh, documentaries, which are blocked for years because of the bizarre copyright claims, privacy claims, etc. Um, allowing the state or counting on the state to prop up the creative process is uh, is totally unrealistic and unworkable. So I just want to lay that out there. It doesn't really answer the question directly, but it points out that the there's only two really there's only two real alternatives. That's freedom or the state. Okay, and the state situation just cannot work. Um, the state the state solution ends up causing people to be taxed and regulated, put in jail, um, restricted from using previous works. Um, there's a privacy decision just last week in Europe, which is called the right to be forgotten, where if you have a fact about your previous life or your earlier life uh, somewhere on the Internet, you can go to a court in Europe, and they will issue an order to Google to remove the, the link to a search on you so people can't find out um, a certain fact about you in the past. Basically, it's airbrushing history. It's the Orwellian. This, you know, this is what totalitarian dictatorships do. They just rewrite the past. Um, so in the name of all these attempts of the state to step in and be the guardian of people's creative works and their privacy rights, it ends up restricting our freedoms. So the only real alternative is uh, the free market and freedom. So how would authors make money? Well, some would, some would have a job, a regular job. And they would do this as a side hobby. There's nothing wrong with this. I think Francis Ford Coppola, one of my uh, blog posts on c4saf.org, if you just search for Francis Ford Coppola, you know, the, the, uh, the director, um, he says, you know, what's wrong with getting up at three or four or five in the morning and writing, working on your play for two or three hours and then going to work during the day in a regular job? Um, so some people would have to support themselves. They would be their own patrons, basically. Um, but as we see in the world today with the internet, we're having an emerging um, set of institutions and practices that enable there, – there's something called – I think it's called Patron, P-A-T-R-A-O-N, A-E-O-N. I may be misspelling it. Patron means patron. Um, uh, there's Indiegogo. There's other things like this where uh, – Kickstarter where – people can find ways to get supported by their fans or by people who support their works. So the ultimate answer is an entrepreneurial one. It's basically how do you find a way to get supported or to support a project that you want to engage in, either for profit or not for profit. It's really an entrepreneurial question, and there's lots of suggestions about this. On my blog, c4sif.org, I have some posts about um, how can innovators get uh, make uh, get rewarded without intellectual property, and there's different techniques people use. I've mentioned some of them already tonight. There's uh, Indiegogo campaigns. There's uh, patron support. Um, there is uh, you can do what Louis C.K. did, which he sold one of his. Um, he had a website where he sold one of his comedy performances for five dollars a download, totally open source, DRM free. And he made several million dollars in just a week, uh, way more than he needed to to cover his costs. And then he you know, gave his staff $200,000 bonuses for Christmas and all this. It was great. And so, yeah, maybe it petered off after a while, but so what? It's better than you, it would be in a, in a, in a, in a copyright-controlled society. So the ultimate answer is we don't know exactly how you can make money um, in any endeavor in the free market. Uh, but there's lots of ideas about how you could, and there's lots of uh, reason to believe that there are things you could do absent copyright and patent to make money. And not, for, not only that, remember this. There are more ways to make money absent copyright because your, your, your restrictions that tie you down are now gone. So lots of companies and producers and creators that are now restricted by copyright 
um, would be freed. So they would also lose the ability to go around suing people for royalties. That's true. But they would also be freed to use whatever they wanted. Um, you know, if you want to have a Michael Jackson hologram at a concert, you can do that. If you want to perform someone's song and do it in a better way, like the Canadian astronaut performing the, uh, the David Bowie song, uh, you can do it. Um, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but just uh, like the last week, uh, Dave, David, uh, there was a David Bowie song performed on the space shuttle on the space station by a Canadian astronaut a year ago. And he took the time to get a copyright license from David Bowie's uh, uh, representative. And, but he, he could only get it for a year. And so he performed some kind of uh, acoustic rendering in space of a David Bowie song. And it was very popular on YouTube. I actually never saw it, but I read about this. Well, just a couple of days ago, it had to come down because the, the one-year license expired. So those are just examples of the ways that uh, copyright stifles freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and experimental um, uh, artistic uses, which would flourish absent copyright. It, it would be more of a challenge to find a way to make a profit, but there would be more ways to make a profit um, as well. All right, so we've got another uh, another question here from uh, Byrne McCarty. Regarding the defense where you try to establish prior art by publishing your idea, what minimum level of publishing is recommended? Okay, so in the past, um, there was a practice of, uh, before. let's say before the internet age, uh, companies like say IBM, you know, one of the biggest most prolific patenters in the world and the most prolific innovative companies in the world would also make it a strategic decision every year about which ideas they had that they wanted to patent and which ones they did not want to patent. The ones they did not want to patent, they would publish, they would often publish a little short paper by the uh, engineers in a journal that they published. It was like the IBM technical journal or something. And they did that solely to establish a record, a prior art record. Um, with, the, with the advent of the internet, excuse me, it's a little bit easier. And by the way, there, there are other ways you can do it too. There, there's something you can do on the, um, you can go to the USPTO.gov, that's the United States Patent and Trademark Office website, USPTO.gov. And instead of hiring a patent attorney to file a patent application, which takes thousands of dollars, you could do something called an SIR, Statutory Invention Registration. It, there's a small fee involved, I think $100, $200, something like that. And that would be a way of publishing it too. But you don't need to go to that expense. In today's world, you could really simply just publish it on a blog. Make sure the blog is going to be around for a few decades and just, just publish the idea. Um, what's key is that you have to disclose the idea in sufficient technical detail. So this is a case where I wouldn't worry about being boring or verbose or being overly technical. More is better. So just publish everything you can think of. Have a long post or a, put a paper that you can link to in a blog post which has all the details that you can think of. You basically have to enable – you have to have an enabling disclosure. An enabling disclosure means you have to um, provide enough written details in a written description sufficient to enable someone skilled in the art to make and use your invention without undue experimentation. Now, that's a lot of technical legalese, but that's basically the criteria. Um, from a practical standpoint, what that means is you want to have a good technical disclosure which explains how your idea works and that – if you imagine someone else in a similar technical field that read it for the first time, they would read the paper and they would say, oh, I get this idea. And they would be able to go out and go in their garage or their workshop or their laboratory, and they would be able to make this eventually um, because you gave them enough details. So if you disclose that level of detail, then on the day you publish it, from that day forward, um, no one else – well, I won't say they won't be able to patent it. Because they could patent it because the patent office doesn't find that disclosure. But even if they were patenting it, then that reference that you had published would be there and could be used to invalidate the patent later. 
So, um, um, and by the way, let me just make make clear. This changed the the law changed uh, when the when Obama changed the uh, the uh, the patent law a few years ago in the Obama in the America Invents Act. Um, before that point in time, there was like a one year grace period. So if you published a paper on day one, then there was still a danger that in the next year someone else could still patent it. They couldn't patent it if they learned about it from your paper because they wouldn't be the inventor. But if they independently invented it, they could still file a patent on it. But under the uh, Obama uh, America Invents Act, um, that changed. And so from the day you publish it, it serves as a, what's called an absolute statutory um, bar. Uh, there's an ap what's called an absolute novelty requirement now. In any case, the, the quicker you publish it and the more detail you give, the better. Um, now, the danger is that you're going to let your competitors know what you're doing. And they can start competing with you. But realistically, if you have a real product, that's going to happen anyway if you don't have a patent. You know, if you start selling a product as popular, uh, you're going to advertise its features and or its features and, you know, secret sauce will be able to be discerned by reverse engineering anyway. And competitors will start reverse engineering this and making knockoffs, which means competing with you very soon anyway. So you're really not out anything by publishing it. Um, so that, that's the answer to that question. All right. Um, for our next question, we've got uh, Travis, the green guy, uh, who would like to come on air to ask. Um, yes. I don't know if you don't mind. I have two questions. One, uh, how would you do with trademark specifically? Uh, how will, for example, if Coca-Cola has their trademark on their symbol, the whole nine yards, what would it, you know, it would be relatively easy to make another can with the exact same symbol, with the exact same, maybe even the same product, especially if that product ingredients got released, uh, what protection would there be and how would that work in the free society without trademark? Because I, I completely agree with you on copyright and patents, but I just don't, you know, that's really the only example that I can think of as far as, you know, protection is needed. Because on the internet, it doesn't, doesn't matter, you can change your logo. But for companies who invest millions of dollars in creating these logos and creating this brand, it's you know almost impossible and very expensive just to flip the switch and change the logo. Uh, have you? I was reading some of your podcasts or listening to your podcasts. What? Why did you say? Well, well, explain it. What? Why did you mention the ingredients of Coca Cola? Tell, tell me what the relevance of the ingredient because because the ingredients well, is more about the trade secret, not the trademark. Is that? Are my you apologies. That was me. Here? That was that was me correcting the example. Let's say if that secret did get out, get out. It's a product that can be remade, and the logo that can be copied. You know, what to protect them from, especially if it's a physical product, not an internet product. If it's a physical product that can okay. be remade and then the logo can be copied, you know, that's the only thing I can think of that would throw a hole in this. Because I completely agree with you and I've listened to your podcast and I've read some of your essays on this topic. Mm -hmm. And I think you're brilliant. It's just I can't think of a way that the system would protect people in a situation like that where the product can be copied and the logo. How would you differentiate yourself, or how would it be? You know, how would it work? Okay, so um, no, it's a good question. Um, trademark is a confusing issue, especially because libertarians are a little bit um, sloppy with the fraud concept that they throw out there. So libertarians will often say, you know, we're against the initiation of force um, and fraud. But they never quite explain why fraud is part of an aggression or initiation of force or exactly what it means. Um, yeah. And then they'll sometimes use fraud to mean being dishonest, and which would, which would imply that anytime you tell a lie that you're basically violating someone's rights, which is not really true. right? Dishonesty is not a good thing, but it's not always a rights violation. So this, this fraud concept of the liberty and, – and not only that. Um, if they support trademark law because they're against fraud, why do we need trademark law? Because fraud is already 
allegedly a crime or a, you know a, a cause of action in a libertarian contract or whatever legal system. So it's not really clear exactly what they mean. Um, so here's what I think would happen. First of all, think about the case of um, just people in names, like your name, uh, my name, you know, Matt's name. I mean, what, what's to keep me from naming my son Matt Gilliland if I wanted to? Or maybe there are <laughs> 20 Matt Gillilands in the country right now. I don't know. It could, be, it could be the case. Now, what's to keep that from happening? Well, first of all, nothing's going to keep it from happening. And it is, there are probably more than one – my name is a little bit unique, but there's probably more than one Norman Kinsella in the world. Um, there's probably more than one Travis in the world. You know, um, So – it's not a really a problem that there's more than one, right? So you could have more than one Mr. Hamburger in the world, and it probably wouldn't be the world's biggest disaster. It only gets to be a problem when the, the reputation gets to be big and you use it as part of your sales pitch and your marketing. So here's what I think would happen. I do think fraud would be a cause of action in a libertarian society, but only in a narrow sense. That is, fraud understood as a type of deceit and theft from a customer by trick or by deception. So, oh, so you'd have the so, customer basically do the lawsuit and they're not the So trader. so that that's so part part of the problem with trademark law is that the 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 person that holds the trademark is the company using the mark, the trademark holder. So they can sue someone using their their mark um, even though the allegedly wronged victim is not the trademark holder but the customer okay and number two if the customer is wronged it's only because they're defrauded but if they're defrauded they already have a fraud right so why do they need a trademark right and in fact trademark law gives them the right to sue even when there's no fraud and in fact it gives the trademark holder the right to sue not the customer um so for example take the case of um I, I just think that, that this is really not a problem. I, I do think that the problem of copyright – that copyright and patent advocates point to is a real problem. Well, I don't think it's a problem, but it's a real phenomenon. It is true that if you start making a new pharmaceutical drug um, or if you sell a novel, it is true that people without a copyright or patent system will be able to com compete with you and copy that. That is true. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a good thing, but you know that's the way it is. But in the in the trademark case, I think that there's really a non-problem because there's really two main situations. Number one, we have a cheap knockoff, which is not fraudulent. So, for example, you know, a fake Rolex watch for twenty dollars being sold by some guy with a with a with a heavy briefcase, a uh, heavy uh, trench coat full of watches on the streets of New York, uh, or a van, you know, kind of a, one of these uh, sh shady situations. Um, in that case, there's no fraud whatsoever going on. The customer has no complaint. The customer knows he's buying a knockoff watch. Um, so no one's rights, property rights are being violated whatsoever, and that should not be prohibited. Um, the other situation would be where imagine I want to buy a Rolex watch, and I have $5,000 saved up to buy a Rolex watch. And I've always wanted one for my whole life, and I've worked my life, and I've saved up. I go to the Galleria here in Houston, the Houston Galleria, and there's all these nice posh stores, Louis Vuitton and you know Zenia and um, all these nice stores. And I walk into a store with a Rolex label over it, and I buy a Rolex watch for $5,000. Well, then I find out later it was a fake. Well, if that really happened, I suppose I would have a cause of action for fraud against this company. Okay, and I do I do admit that there would be a cause of action for fraud. It's hard to imagine that actually happening in real life, though, because um, how would this company get set up? How would they actually have a storefront in a Galleria? You know, the Galleria is not going to host a knockoff company. It's getting sued left and right every day for fraud. The company is not going to be able to su with survive for very long if they're getting massive you know lawsuits by one customer after another for fraud. The, the, the fact is that when people start their own companies and they're legitimate businessmen, they want their own names on it. They want to distinguish themselves from the customer. Just think of think of the hamburger industry in the U.S. It seems like a homogenous thing. Everyone's got hamburgers. There's really no difference between McDonald's, Wendy's, 
um, Burger King. And yet the people that started these companies think there's a difference, right? You know, Burger King didn't say McDonald's. They said Burger King. Wendy's call themselves Wendy's. You know, if you have Hardee's, Wendy's, you have Crystal Burger. So everyone, any legitimate company is going to want their own name on it. So I just don't think it's a real problem. Uh, but to the extent there's a problem, basically fraud law, I think, would, 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 would cover it. Um, but in that situation, as, you'd have yeah. the... You'd have the customer doing the legal action and not the company per se. Yes, and you, and you, you you could theoretically have class actions, right? Like let's say there's thousands of customers defrauded by some company, and you could imagine situations. Um, but almost every trademark case you hear of in today's world is is totally bogus. Um, you have uh, uh, Toyota, which sells Lexus, L-E-X-U-S cars. I'm sorry, it was the other way around. You had Lexus Nexus, L E X I S, the, the news service suing Toyota 15 or so years ago when they came out with their Lexus car because they said that was confusingly similar to customers. Now, who's really going to buy a Lexus automobile and believe that it's being sold to them by Lexus Nexus news publishing? I mean, no one. So there's no fraud whatsoever. This is what happens all the time. And in fact, trademark law is used. Primarily nowadays for censorship and free sp to, to shut down. Uh, I think one one of the cases there's a guy up in uh, Maine or Connecticut or one of these uh, New England states who was selling. Um, he sells T-shirts that says "Eat more kale," K-A-L-E, and Chick-fil-A sued him because they have their slogan is "Eat more chicken," spelled M-O-R. You know, misspelled actually because the you know the, the, the cows can't spell right. And so this poor individual has been defending himself for a couple of years now with donations because some giant corporation is just trying to run him into the ground for no reason. There's no competitive threat whatsoever. There's no fraud whatsoever. There's no harm to their market whatsoever. But trademark law under the current statutes gives them the right to, um, to do this to him. And I don't know if they're going to win or not. I don't know what actually happened. It may be still still be ongoing. But even if he wins, he's going to have spent months of his life and millions of dollars defending himself. So trademark law is not as horrendous, I think, in its effects as patent and copyright, but it's 100% completely illegitimate in, in my view. And so is trade secret law, by the way. Trade secret law is totally unnecessary and illegitimate because you don't need a law to permit you to keep information secret. You can just do it if you have property rights protected. What trade secret law does is it gives you the right to go to a court to issue an injunction against third parties to tell them they can't use information that they got if it's if it's still pretty much secret, if, if you have a trade secret in it. Apple has done this, for example. I think they, they, they used the cops to bust into some guy's house. About three years ago, remember that that iPhone was left by an Apple employee on a bar stool somewhere, and uh, the next day, four, three or four days later, Apple busted and used the cops to to uh, to burst into someone's apartment and to issue to use trade secret law to do this. Um, look, it's their fault that they they left the iPhone out. It's not someone else's fault that they found the iPhone. Maybe they still own the actual iPhone. I would say that under property law principles, they could get their iPhone back. I don't deny that. But if the guy had taken a picture of it or learned something about it and publicized it in the meantime, I don't think he's violated anyone's rights. All right. Thank you, Travis. Um, got a question from Max Hill. Does a public disclosure such as publishing in an academic journal prevent others from patenting any science disclosed? Yes. Well, it doesn't prevent them because the patent system is not perfectly efficient. So it is – as I said, it, that, that would be like saying if you um, don't do anything wrong, does it mean you can't be sued? No, you can still be sued. It just means you should win. You probably will win if you haven't done anything wrong, right? Um, same thing here. Um, the patent system provides that you should not – be able to obtain a patent on an idea that is already public, okay? 
that doesn't mean that the patent office is going to realize that when you when someone applies for a patent. Um, but what it would do is it would give you a defense. So let's say you published your paper on day one, and six months or a year or two years later, someone else independently invents this idea and files a patent on it. And let's say they get a patent because the patent office never sees the uh, your paper that you had published. Well, you don't really care if they have a patent. All you care about is that they assert it against you. And if they threaten you with a patent or if they sue you for patent infringement, then you would have a defense. You could simply say, listen, you have sued me for patent infringement, but I have a paper published before you filed for your patent, which means that your patent is invalid, and I will be able to prove that if you sue me in court. So go away, please. So we, it would at least give you a defense. Um, moreover, if you publish the pat, if you publish the invention in a paper, um, let's be clear: the only way you're supposed to get a patent is if you are the inventor of the patent of the invention. Um, so unless the person who filed the patent independently invented it. They're still not entitled to a patent. So there's two barriers. So if someone learns of the idea from you, they are not the inventor. You are. You just chose not to get a patent on it. You published it. You basically released it into the public domain. By the way, there's no counter. There's no counterpart procedure for this for, in the copyright system. There's really no easy way to make your copyrighted works non-copyrighted or in the public domain. It's almost impossible to do it. Um, they're CC0, but it has dubious validity, and even that is not easy to do the right way. Um, but patents, at least you can. If you just ch refrain from filing for a patent, and if you publish the idea, it basically becomes public domain. All right, we've got a, a question from Wesley Matthew. Uh, in countries with little, little or no copyright protection, how does innovation compare to those with copyright? Um, in today's world, most countries have ex you know most most countries have acceded to uh, the, the modern conventions like the Berne Convention for copyright, uh, the Paris Convention and the Patent Cooperation Treaty for patents, and the WIPO World Intellectual Property Organization. All these different conventions. Um, so most most countries have minimum standards of intellectual property. Um, but mostly at the behest of America and the Western countries, primarily America at the behest of the pharmaceutical industry, the music industry, and Hollywood have twisted the arms of most other countries in the world to go along with our type of system, even though they are basically uh, harmed by it. It's basically a wealth transfer from every other country to the U.S. into these three industries in the U.S., the pharmaceutical, the music industry, and the, and the, uh, the movie industry, Hollywood. Um, so I would say and, – and so there are some countries with lower copyright protections, um, but I would say that's an instance – and they're, they're, they tend to be poorer countries. I, but I think that's, a, that's not an instance of causation and correlation. That's more of an instance of just uh, – uh, it's just correlation. Um, uh, you, you could make other correlations with antitrust law or tax law enforcement. For example, you could say that um, your typical poor country has more corruption, more bribery, and worse tax law enforcement than the U.S. But you couldn't draw the conclusion that, um, that if you have greater tax enforcement and greater antitrust enforcement and less corruption and bribery that you have more wealth. You couldn't draw that conclusion. Um, I, I think the problem is that you, you, you when you, you have these, uh, these, these, uh, these relatively liberal free market economies like the United States, and they become rich because they have relatively free market internal policies, right? We have a very large free market here, pretty much an unregulated free market capitalist property rights system. But the state is there, and the state taxes and survives off of the revenues produced by the underlying economy. So you have these states which become powerful and rich because they are 
parasitically um, taking money off of the underlying economy. And they also tend to expand their own power and authority. They start exerting minimum wage laws, affirmative action laws, anti-discrimination laws. They start becoming more bellicose internationally. That's, they become more imperialistic, more warlike. Um, so you have these things going hand in hand. I would say that the richness of the underlying free market society is the cause of the non-free market things that the state that depends upon the society does rather than the other way around. Now, if you want to take some actual examples, there have been examples in the past, uh, some, some uh, historical episodes. I think in the 1800s or about 50 years, let's say Germany had almost no or very lax copyright laws. And the empirical evidence shows that they were outproducing England, which is a comparable society at the time, in the, term, in the number of published works, things like this. Um, in Italy and Switzerland, I think, for a good 50 or 100 years, had no patents on pharmaceuticals, and yet they were two of the, uh, the largest uh, producers of pharmaceuticals at that time. So there are episodes in history where we can point to where there's been a, a lack of or much more reduced form of patent or copyright in which we can see that there was still um, a huge amount of um, – innovation and research and development and artistic creativity being done anyway. And I've got some, some surveys and some studies on my uh, c4saf.org uh, website to, to that effect. All right, we've got a question from uh, another one from uh, Travis, the green guy. Sure. Which I, sure. I actually like this question a lot. Uh, can a public disclosure from person A also protect person B from a company C's patent that was filed after the publishing date? Yes. Yes, once it's public, um, th there is an – yes, yes, it doesn't matter who published it. As long as it's published, then um, company C's patent is potentially invalid. So company – person B would be able to use person A's publication as a defense. And say that this person sees a patent is invalid because it shouldn't have been issued. Um, now there is a unique twist in the law that Obama had passed, which is that company A, okay, in in the in the in the hypothetical you just gave, person A has one year to file a patent. They can still file their own patent. So person A could disclose their invention on day one. And they have up to one year to decide whether they want to file a patent. They have a one year statute. They have a one year sort of um, a grace period, we call it. Okay, but no one else does. It's it's a bizarre situation. So I can't get into the weeds here, but you could imagine a bizarre situation where person A files on day one. I'm sorry, person A publishes their invention on day one. And, per, and person B publishes or files a patent on day two. Okay. Now, under the under the Obama American Invents Act, we changed our priority system to where the first person who files is entitled to the patent. If there's two competing inventors, the first one who files is entitled to a patent, which is what the rest of the world has in their patent systems. America, until two two three years ago had an, a different system where it was the first to invent. Okay, That's one reason they made this change. But because of this change in the publication grace period, a strange twist of this is that if person, if person A invents the invention first and person B invents it later, then person B can still get the patent if they file first. Okay, That's the basic law right now. But if person A fi uh, makes it public first, then person B is now prohibited from getting a patent on it. But if person A has a year to decide to file. They have a one-year grace period, but it only affects A, not, not, not B. So the only, example, the only exception to the answer to the question is that um, B is protected by A's publication from C's patent, but B wouldn't be protected from A's patent. All right, I've actually got a question. Um, you said uh, you suggested using uh, 
Creative Commons by attribution license. Um, yes. Now, why would you suggest that instead of uh, Creative Commons by attribution, share and share alike, which for the audience means that they have to both attribute the work and they have to release everything they create under the same kind of license, which prevents them from using copyright against others using works um, that are based on yours. So my, my basic thinking is that I want to release my works from copyright as much as possible. If I could, if I could just say this is hereby public domain, that's what I would do, which is what CC0 tries to get at. I'm just afraid CC0 wouldn't be legally effective. It might be. It's not clear. To be honest, I'm not, I'm not even sure if CCBY or any of the CCs are legally effective, but apparently they're, they're being treated that way right now. The reason I'm not a, I'm not sure any CC licenses is legally effective is number one, I'm not clear what the consideration is for the contract, and number two, I'm not sure how the um, the alleged licensee is going to prove he had a license. Um, in a normal copyright license, you and I would would have a document we would sign where you pay me some money, or you do something for me, in exchange for me granting you a license. So there's consideration which is you're giving me something back. And you have to have consideration to have a binding contract in most common law countries. And number two, you have proof of it because you have a copy of the contract. So if I ever sued you for copyright infringement, you could simply say, what are you talking about? You gave me a license. In the Creative Commons case, um, I'm concerned that there's no consideration, and I'm concerned that the person who might be sued for copyright infringement, the licensee, the user, wouldn't be able to prove he had a license. Because So, so let's say I publish a novel on my website and I put CCBY on there. And then in the meantime, you download it and you start making copies of it. Okay, you're permitted to do that. But let's say a year later, I just change the, I just, I just update the file on my website and I change it from CCBY to copyright. And then I sue you for copyright infringement. Now you claim your defense is that you have a license. Well, how do you prove you had a license? When did I grant you this license? Did we negotiate it? Do you have a written, signed copy? So you see there's a, there's a question of proof, and there's also a question of consideration. Even if you can prove that I had the CCBY notice on there, so what? Where's the contract? Where's the, what did you give me? What consideration did you pay me as a user to, to, um, to make the contract valid and binding? So I'm concerned about that, but let's let's put that aside. Let's assume that the Creative Commons is enforceable. The reason I prefer CCBY to CC0 is because I think CCBY has a, a greater chance of being enforceable than CC0 does. And I'm just going by what the Creative Commons Foundation itself says on their on their website. They 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 have these warnings that CC0 may not be enforceable in every jurisdiction and all this kind of stuff. So they have some concern that CC0 is not enforceable, probably because of uh, what's called um, moral rights and also uh, the in inalienability of copyright in some countries like in Europe. Um, CC0 sort of tries to undo what they view as an inalienable human right, which is copyright or something like that. So that's my concern about CC0. I would use CC0, and in fact, I try to use it in a creative way on my website just to shut people up who say I'm a hypocrite for not using it, even though they don't understand that it may not be enforceable, but whatever. So I use CCBY because all it requires is attribution, and I figure that's a restriction that almost no one minds anyway because if you copy someone's work, you, you pretty much want to say who wrote it because otherwise no one's going to want to take the copy you made because they don't have the full copy because the copy includes the author's name. Now the other ones like Share Alike and also ND, which is not no derivative works, and NC, non-commercial use, I don't like those at all. I certainly don't like non-commercial and non-derivative because it's an attempt to use copyright law to prevent people from using your work as, you, as they want to use it. Um, if you're going to use not NC or ND, no creative works, I'm sorry, sorry no, no commercial use or no derivative works, you might as well just have a copyright notice and prevent people from using your work. I don't really see why you would use CC uh, at all in that case. In fact, I think they're vague. I don't really know what a non-commercial use really means because if I have a quote-unquote not-for-profit blog or a hobby blog like I do, 
but I have Google advertising in the corner of my website and I copy someone's TC and C, you know, work. Is, am I using it commercially because it's helping draw traffic to my website and I'm making some Google AdSense revenue? I don't know. Maybe. But the point is that's not a good license because it's, a restri it's restrictive. So I do understand the share-alike license. The share-alike license is the one that some libertarians and others prefer to use instead of BY, which is attribution only. It's more similar to what's used in the copy in the in the software case of the um, the open source type licenses, which is um, I forgot is it the GNU or something like that, where you have to um, yeah the GNU um, GPL GPL. So you, so if if you use someone's source code, the the con the only condition is you have to release your source code that borrows from it under a similar license. Um, I can understand that idea. I think it makes – I don't like it even in software to be honest. I prefer to just open things up and let people do what they want with them. One reason people do that is they have a, a mistaken understanding of what copyright is. They say, well, if I don't copyright my works, then someone else is going to run around and copyright it. Well, first of all, you don't copyright anything. As I said, it's automatic, so that's a mistaken understanding of how copyright works. So I don't think that, that's a good reason to do it. Um, I just don't like CC uh, share alike because – let me give you one example. If I have an – like the journal Libertarian Papers, which I created and which I'm the executive editor of, we have a, a CCBY policy. If we had a CC share alike policy, then – well, under our current policy, any, any publisher that wants to use one of our articles in one of their books – like let's say there's an anthology of articles on a certain topic, and they want to take one or two Libertarian Papers articles. They can do that without asking our permission. They don't need my permission. They don't need the journal's permission. They don't need the author's permission. They already have their permission. It's built into the article under the CCBY. They can use it, and we want our ideas out there, so that's a good thing. Okay. So if I can't find the author, if the author is dead or his widow's around and she's, you know, she's crazy or whatever, that's not going to be a hindrance to this idea getting out there. If it's CC share alike. Most books are being published by uh, publishing companies with fairly standard um, copyright policies, and they're not going to have a CCBY policy or even a CC share alike policy. So they can't include this article in this book unless they make the whole book CC share alike. So I'm restricting what they can do with it, and I'm, it's like I'm trying to use copyright law to twist their arms to become a libertarian. Or to have a libertarian policy, and I just don't like that. I prefer to have it open and let them do with it as they see fit. the The article is still CCBY, even if they include it in their book. Their book may be copyright normally, right? So someone still couldn't copy their book, but that's their decision, not mine. So I don't feel it's my obligation to use my copyright leverage to force other people to adopt a similar policy in their other published works. So that, that's my reasoning. I respect other libertarians who prefer to use the CC share alike um, as more of an activist tool, but I think they're hurting themselves because, as I said, you basically are preventing your work from being used in any other kind of uh, journal or, 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 or omnibus volume or collected anthology because they just – the CC share alike copyright provision is tantamount to a copyright provision which means they can't use it without getting the permission of the author. And the whole purpose of the CCBY is so that people can use it without having to come to you for permission. So that's sort of my thinking on that issue. All right, one last question before we call it a night. I know there are a ton more questions. That just means that uh, Stefan's going to have to come back sometime. Uh, yeah, I'll be Bob happy to come back. And pe people can email me too, by the way, so that, that's fine. So go ahead. From the county. Uh, could blockchain technology be adapted to record patents as it authenticates Bitcoin transactions? I'm trying to think how to answer this. Um, <laughs> I think pat I think patents are completely illegitimate grants of monopoly privilege by the state. So I don't want to find a way to make them um, more efficacious. And also, this question gets at a, a non-problem. I mean, patents are – the word patent means open. 
That's what it means. They're by definition public, uh, which is why these people that think that there are these secret patents out there that, that the oil industry has gobbled up and kept 100 mile per gallon carburetors and engine designs off the market um, makes no sense. Because if they existed, you could find them with a search on the USPTO.gov website. So in other words, we already have a record of the patents. It's the USPTO.gov website and other websites around the world, WIPO websites and, and the PCT search engines, things like that. So I, there's, there's no problem with knowing who has which patent. Every patent has a unique serial number already. It's already made public. It's already easily searchable. And believe me, if you're sued by someone for patent infringement, they will be able to prove they have a patent. So there's no problem of the – there's no inability of patent holders right now to prove they have a patent. Um, I think what the question is getting at is something different. I think they just worded it um, um, legally um, imprecisely. I think what they're saying is could you have a free market system which doesn't rely upon the state or a state patent office where people could register their – inventions and get some kind of protection for them that way. Um, and I think that's a premature question because it you don't need Bitcoin for that or something like the, the blockchain for that. Um, that would just make it more efficient, right? The question is, would that make sense in the first place? I think the Tannehills, by the way, in The Market for Liberty, which is an anarchist uh, book from the 70s, Morris and Linda Tannehill, they were basically Randians, objectivists who became anarchists, but they still clung to the IP idea. And they, they proposed in a few paragraphs in that book that maybe you could have some kind of private free market system for protecting inventions other than the patent system. What they proposed was that you could register your ideas with some title agency, and you wouldn't have to rely upon the government to do that, but once you had it registered, you could use some kind of private legal system to sue people who are using your ideas because you had shown that you were the first one to invent this idea, and you could you could point to a public record of it. So I guess you could imagine a blockchain-type uh, system would be a more efficient way of recording information like that. I just don't think information like that is relevant in a free market. In other words, it's not legally relevant who first came up with an idea because there's no property rights in ideas in the first place. So yes, I think the blockchain could be used for that. Um, probably a more realistic or practical example or, or use of the blockchain would be registering ideas for uh, for credit. Like for example, um, Leibniz and Newton. You know, there's a fight over who came up with calculus first. And you know Einstein and others had fights over who came up with certain physics theories first. But it wasn't for legal property or IP reasons or patent reasons. It was just for uh, credit in the scientific community. So I suppose you could imagine a blockchain being used for that. But that's totally a private social convention which has nothing to do with, with the law. Um, so I would say because ideas and information cannot be owned and are not the subject of property rights… It wouldn't make sense to imagine a private uh, record-keeping system, including blockchain, being used to track the you know, sort of the, the authorship of ideas uh, for some kind of property rights purpose in a free society. Anyway. All right. Thanks, everybody, and thank you, Stefan. Uh, we've had a great time here tonight, and we'll definitely have uh, Stefan back here soon. Uh, Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, we've got a, an author's forum with Tom Palmer uh, over the, uh, the new uh, SFL book, Peace, Love, and Liberty. So join us there tomorrow night. Hope to see you there. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and take care. Have a good night.